All right, good morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you very much for joining us um, on this Humboldt Day celebration um, event. This is in Southern New Zealand. So we're down here at the University of Otago at the far Southern end of New Zealand. It's basically sub-Antarctic. I think we're at similar latitudes to some of the sub-Antarctic islands. And it's a very sub-Antarctic environment. We've got albatrosses and penguins just outside the door. And um, yesterday was a lovely warm 22 degrees. And today we're back to a much more standard 10 degrees or so. We've got a great lineup of speakers today. I tried to find people from right across the university. We've got a really big strength in biogeography here at the University of Otago. So people across many different departments are interested in the processes that shape distributions of plants, animals and people on earth. So we've got people from across four different departments, uh, the Department of Anatomy, Lisa, um, quite a few from zoology where there's a strong concentration of biogeographers, um, marine science, me and William, and also the Department of Botany. So we're going to start broad with a talk from Lisa Madison smith talking about the peopling of the Pacific, or movement of people across the Pacific, um, and the biogeographic implications of that. And then we'll move down into the Southern Ocean and Antarctic, and then come back up to New Zealand. Um, so we're going to have six different talks with seven speakers and each talk will be about 10 minutes long. We're going to save all the questions for the end just because we're going to try to keep to quite a tight schedule. So if you can um, put your questions in the Q&A of the Zoom, then of the webinar, then uh, William, my uh, a student who's just started in my group, is going to collect those questions and we'll try to pick some that we can um, address as a group at the end. You can also ask questions to individual speakers. All right, so let's kick off. Um, first talk is Lisa. Okay, hang on a sec. <laughs> I don't know why it's not letting me out. It was working before. Maybe try that one there. Yeah. getting somewhere now, but I just don't seem to have a cursor here. John? <laughs> There's no cursor showing up on this you have laptop. To go anymore. Left. That's a problem that I was having. Yeah. Oh, okay, got it. Yeah. My apologies, audience, we're just uh, finding our way. Well, kia ora koto, ko te wiki o te reo Māori. It's actually the uh, second day of Māori Language Week, and I'm going to be talking about the settlement of the Pacific, which ultimately resulted in the settlement of Aotearoa, New Zealand. So I'm a biological anthropologist in the Department of Anatomy. And for the last 30 years or so, um, I have been working on tracking uh, the movement of people through a number of, of methods using particularly mitochondrial DNA, but now we're working on whole genome uh, data from Pacific peoples, but really trying to reconstruct the settlement of what we call remote Oceania that began about 3,000 years ago as part of a Lapita expansion, a cultural expansion out of island Southeast Asia. Um, and uh, about 3,000 years ago, they breached uh, kind of the barrier into the islands of remote Oceania where they are the first people to settle these islands. And these Lapita people got as far as uh, Samoa and Tonga on the edge of the Polynesian Triangle by about, uh, by about 2,900 years ago, stopped there, and then about 1,500 or 2,000 years later, they started expanding again. Populations moved into the center of the Polynesian Triangle Society Islands, and then from there up to Hawaii, out to Rapa Nui or Easter Island, and finally down here to Aotearoa, New Zealand, settling New Zealand about 750, 730 years before present or years BP. Now, um, one of the strategies of Pacific, Pacific colonists and Pacific settlement was the fact that people, these people who were moving out into these previously uninhabited islands, um, took with them their important uh, food items, their important plants and animals, and what we refer to as transported landscapes. And this was, let's say, part of the settlement strategy um, that these voyages um, were not drift voyages. These were not people who got into a canoe and hoped to let, you know, find land. These were very um, planned strategic voyages 
uh, that were first voyages of exploration. Once the island was found, the voyagers would then come back and take their colonists with all of their plants and animals to a known location um, on, on the new island, and they would introduce those plants and animals. And what we realized about 30 years ago was that we could actually use the genetic um, relationships of these different plants and animals around the Pacific Islands as a proxy to reconstruct the movement of the humans and the movement of the canoes in which they were transported. So people carried with them a number of domesticated plants and animals, but also some non-domesticated animals. And we started working on one of these, the Pacific rats. So rats, dogs, pigs, and chickens were all animals that were introduced uh, to the islands by people. Uh, in their canoes, they could not self-disperse. So uh, the develop, we developed this commensal model or, or tracking genetic data from commensal species as a proxy to track human migration and mobility. Now we've learned a number of lessons along the way and we published uh, a number of papers on all of the different species, but um, what I'm gonna be presenting here is the lessons that we've learned over that 30 years. And the most important one and the first really uh, the basis of the commensal model was that we had to engage with indigenous knowledge and, and engage, with, engage with indigenous communities and understand uh, the Pacific from a Pacific perspective. And this allowed us to challenge the very Eurocentric views that many uh, researchers have, have applied in the past when trying to understand Pacific settlement. Um, the, first rat, the first animal that we studied was the Pacific rat. And of course, the assumption was from a European's perspective, rats are bad, rats are stowaways. Um, nobody would intentionally take a rat. And of course, from a Pacific perspective, and I was lucky to be introduced to this through many of my Maori and Pacific colleagues, the rat is a taonga or a treasured species. It has a very different relationship with humans and it was intentionally transported in these kind of um, carriers or you can see on the right there, um, a, a rat transportation uh, carrier in the waka. And it was an important um, food item as well. So it had cultural significance uh, and there was a reason why people intentionally transported this animal. We've also learned over the years of studying dogs and pigs and rats and chickens um, that chronology is uh, chronology matters and that you really have to have a good understanding of the chronological uh, control in your in your sampling. Um, and this has allowed us to introduce or to to identify that there have been a number of chronologically separate introductions of different lineages of these animals to the islands through time. And we're identifying this through mitochondrial lineages and the new appearance of particular lineages um, in the archeological record um, through time. So we've identified, for example, three introductions of dog to the Pacific. Um, all three of them get to New Guinea, but only one of them gets out into Polynesia. Um, and that's, it does not appear in Polynesia until quite late uh, in West Polynesia, um, about 1500 at the earliest, but probably about 1200 years before present. Similarly, we see two introductions of chickens into the Pacific. One that is associated with the early migrants uh, about 3000 years ago. And then we see a second introduction again, sometime after 1500 uh, years ago, 1500 BP. So you really have to have good chronological control of your samples. We've also learned throughout the years um, that obviously more data gives you better answers. Um, and we started off, of course, in the early days of ancient DNA, just looking at a small hypervariable region uh, sequence and control region sequences from ancient samples of chickens. And through those, we found we identified what looked like two distinct lineages that have been identified as lineage E and lineage D. E is a very common lineage that is found in uh, modern chickens, but it was the lineage that we found in the oldest chickens in our archaeological record. And, and as a result, some people suggested that those E lineages were contamination. We can now do complete mitochondrial genome sequencing from ancient samples. And what those complete mitogenomes have shown us is that what appeared to be E lineages, just looking at the control region, when you sequence the complete mitochondrial genome from those populations, they were actually a subset of D. And um, so the whole, the complete mitochondrial genome has shown that this is, they are two different uh, subgroups of lineage D in the Pacific, which is not a common Pacific, uh, a common lineage in chickens today. And it allows us to reject that possibility that the E lineages are the result of contamination. <laughs> 
we really have shown that we have to use multi multidisciplinary approaches and use all of the uh, types of information that are available to us, the archaeological evidence, the genetic evidence, and, for example, the linguistic evidence. So what we found in the genetic evidence and the archaeological evidence was that the lineages of dogs that we see in Polynesia um, is, uh, as I say, chronologically distinct, but there are no dogs between Polynesia and New Guinea. And uh, the linguistic evidence has shown us that that is consistent, that we don't see any linguistic evidence uh, linking the dogs um, to Taiwan or to New Guinea, uh, but in Polynesia that they are a late introduction. Similarly, with the introduction of the sweet potato, which is another commensal species, uh, the linguistic evidence tells us that, that there is a connection between South America and Polynesia, which because they're sharing the same language for this item, um, tells us that natural dispersal uh, was not likely that people actually had to meet in order to share both the, the potato and the word for the potato. And this is also consistent with the, the pollen evidence that shows that potatoes are not, the sweet potato is not present until about a thousand years ago in Polynesia. So it's not a natural disperser that has been there for a million years or so. And most of all, we have to consider human agency when we're looking at how these species appear and disappear across uh, the Pacific Island, that people are making choices as to when and where to sail, choices as to which species to transport or not transport, and they also are making decisions regarding the maintenance of those species. And for, some, for example, we see the extirpation of pigs on some small atolls uh, because of competition uh, for resources. So finally, um, the big story is people move out of island Southeast Asia in their canoes beginning about 5,000 years ago. By 3,000 years ago, they are in uh, West Polynesia. They stop there for a period of time. Eventually they sail across the Pacific Ocean. They actually arrive and make contact uh, in the Americas where they introduce chickens. Uh, they then move up the coast where they pick up the sweet potato from the Gulf of Guayaquil. And the linguistic evidence tells us that. The sweet potato is then transported back into Polynesia and dispersed throughout the region. So this is uh, in, in view of Humboldt today. They're taking that Humboldt current uh, and I'll leave it there with happy Humboldt Day. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lisa. It feels a little odd to, um, to not have clapping at the end of a talk, <laughs> doesn't it? Maybe we could do our own. It feels, <laughs> feels very artificial. <coughs> Da, 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 da. All right, so I'm going to talk now about um, a question that I've been uh, coming back to several times over the past few years, and that's the question of biological isolation of Antarctica. And this is really um, uh, based on a paper that was published a couple of years ago um, that some of you who came to the IBS conference um, year before last might have seen me talk about. But it's also a story about how I've changed my mind because back in 2012, I led a review paper where I looked at all the um, available evidence of the role of the Southern Ocean as a barrier to dispersal. And I concluded that Antarctic ecosystems are biologically isolated, that there's not much movement into and out of the Antarctic and hasn't been for millions of years. Um, but then, uh, in 2018, uh, led a paper that said exactly the opposite, that now we have pretty good evidence that these ecosystems are not biologically isolated, that, there's, that, that the difference between Antarctic ecosystems and those further north is really an environmental one. So we know that Antarctica is geographically isolated. It's down at the southern tip of the world, it's surrounded by the Southern Ocean, home to the strongest current in the world, the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. And it's also got these circumpolar uh, thermal fronts, such as the Antarctic Polar Front, that we've always thought of as barriers to north-south or south-north dispersal. There isn't a lot of evidence of biological movement into and out of the Antarctic in the last few million years, except by really big sort of megafauna that are strong swimmers or flyers, such as seals, penguins, flying birds, and um, other marine uh, organisms like marine mammals. Those can swim into and out of Antarctic waters. But for smaller things, such a lot of marine invertebrates, the genetic evidence suggests that they've been isolated in the Antarctic for millions of years without much interaction with um, sister species or sister lineages further north. 
So then I was flummoxed a couple of years ago when some colleagues in Chile, Erasmo um, and Nelson, sent me this image. Um, and it was a photo they'd taken in King George Island of southern bull kelp, Davilia antarctica. And um, Davilia antarctica is a species that grows around the cool temperate regions of the southern hemisphere. It's a very important species ecologically. You can see it there on a subantarctic island really blanketing the shore. It also floats extremely well. So um, we've always thought that maybe it could travel across oceans and carry um, other organisms with it. So to find this bit of bull kelp washed up on a beach in um, Antarctica was quite surprising. It doesn't grow anywhere near Antarctica. It grows around the coasts of New Zealand, around the subantarctic islands, and up along the coast of Chile. But the piece of kelp the two pieces of kelp that Nelson and Erasmo found were um, at the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula on King George Island. So how did it get there? Um, and what did it carry with it? So we know that bull kelp can carry animals some distance at sea. They've got these holdfasts attached to the base, which are often hollowed out and filled with diverse invertebrates and um, other organisms. So often mollusks and crustaceans, worms, echinoderms, bryozoans, and other algae can live inside that holdfast. So there's potential for these bull kelp rafts to carry entire communities across oceans. And some of the other talks um, today are going to look more at some of those species. When we look, as, as Lisa said, um, genomic methods have um, improved what we can do these days. So when I first started looking at rafting bull kelp, I was using very basic markers that really couldn't determine um, the origin of any raft. But now we've got genomic approaches um, that have much higher resolution. So using about 16,000 SNPs um, from a genotyping by sequencing approach, we're able to build a phylogenetic tree of um, all the places that we've ever collected bull kelp from around the sub-Antarctic and along the coast of Chile and New Zealand. And we get pretty good geographic resolution. So there's a clade for the sub-Antarctic, there's a clade for Chile and a clade for New Zealand. But even within the sub-Antarctic, using these methods, we can now um, resolve different regions, in some cases, different islands, in some cases, even different parts of different islands. So we get good geographic se separation, um, phylogeographic separation. For example, within um, the Malvinas, the Falkland Islands, there are two distinct um, clades. That's just because I only sampled two, two areas. Probably if we sampled more, we'd get even more um, distinction. But we, using these methods, we can say conclusively that the two pieces of kelp found on King George Island, one of them had come from the Kerguelen Islands and one of them had come from South Georgia. And both of those are um, quite far from where the kelp was found. But how did they get there? Everything we know about Southern Ocean oceanography suggests that it shouldn't be possible. Because of Ekman transport and the Coriolis effect, um, Drifting objects moving east in the uh, Antarctic circumpolar current should eventually be pushed north in the southern hemisphere. They shouldn't be moving south. So I spoke to some oceanographers, um, Adele Morrison and Andy Hogg at the Australian National University, and they said, well, maybe mesoscale eddies could be helping to transport drifting objects. These are packets of water that can sometimes pop through the fronts, and they might be helping um, the kelp to get across the fronts and get into Antarctic waters. So they modelled it. They released 4 million simulated particles from Kerguelen Islands. Um, but even with those mesoscale eddies incorporated in the models, all of the particles went east and eventually headed off to the north. Nothing could get to Antarctica. So they said, no, sorry, Crid, it's completely impossible. It doesn't happen. But we knew it did happen. We had the kelp, we had the empirical evidence, we had the genomic data to show that it could get there. So they scratched their heads a bit more and then they said maybe Stokes drift could be helping. Stokes drift is essentially the spiraling motion or the horizontal transport of particles by surface waves. So as a wave comes along, imagine surfing, it kind of pushes a particle a little forward um, across the surface of the ocean and then drops out. The next wave comes along and pushes the particle a little further. So it's horizontal transport driven by wind-driven um, wind surface waves. And when we incorporate Stokes drift in the model, suddenly we're able to get just a few particles from Kerguelen Island of those 4 million that were released, just a few of them were able to reach the Antarctic coast. 
from South Georgia, it was even more striking. So suddenly we're getting quite a large number, uh, about 0.2% of the particles that were released from South Georgia, able to reach the Antarctic coast. So this shows that um, what we understood of Southern Ocean dynamics wasn't really right, that in fact, um, surface drift particles, the ones that are most subject to movement by Stokes drift, are able to cross the um, oceanographic fronts and get into Antarctic waters. This happens, we think, over a biologically relevant time frame. So most of the particles that were released were able to reach the Antarctic coast within one to two years. And we think that probably the kelp could survive that long, could be photosynthetically active still after about that time. And because many of the species that live in the holdfast, um, they, they brood their young. So you've got generation after generation in the same holdfast. There's potential for those organisms too to be transported right around the Southern Ocean, right down to the Antarctic. And just uh, further evidence that, that Stokes Drift is probably having a big impact on these dispersal events. Um, the timing of the release had a very strong impact on whether the kelp was able to reach the Antarctic coast or not. So we found, for example, releases from South Georgia, the particles released in January and February, none of them reached the Antarctic coast, whereas those released in April, quite a lot of them reached the Antarctic coasts. So we think that the kelp rafts are intersecting with storm tracks, these cyclical storm tracks that go around the Southern Ocean. And those increase Stokes drift by increasing wind, and that's able to push drift particles across the fronts, and they get into the Antarctic waters and then hit the coast. This was quite exciting, not just because it shows that drift particles can reach the Antarctic, but also because it's evidence for extremely long biological rafting events. So the particles that um, the shortest simulated trajectory from Kerguelen was 20,000 kilometres. And the average of, of trajectories from South Georgia was 25 kilometres. That's because some of them were sneaking back the short way around the Weddell Sea in the Weddell Gyre, and others were going, most of them were going right the long way around Antarctica um, and coming back on the West Antarctic Peninsula. And even though the proportion of particles that were reaching Antarctica um, was quite small. So 0 0.0001 in the case of Kerguelen, up to about 0.2 in the case of um, releases from South Georgia. When you put that in the context of the number of kelp rafts we think are drifting in the Southern Ocean at any time, so there's estimated to be around 70 million in the Southern Ocean at any time, then back of the envelope calculation would suggest that somewhere between a handful and several thousand kelp rafts, Davilia kelp rafts, are hitting the Antarctic coast every month, um, if, we, if we calculate that across two years. So that's quite a significant propagule pressure, quite a lot of biological material bombarding Antarctic coasts. So this shows that, Antarct that floating objects can reach Antarctica, and that obviously has implications not just for bull kelp communities and the, um, the invertebrates associated with bull kelp, but for anything that's floating at the surface of, Antarctic, uh, of the Southern Ocean. So that could include plastics, plant seeds, and various driftwood and um, other floating algae. Could, could be reaching Antarctica. And there has been a, a more recent study that shows that um, macrocystis rafts can also hit Antarctic coast. So at the moment, these kelp rafts aren't really able to have much of an impact. They're, they're getting to Antarctica, but they're clearly not establishing. We haven't found any growing bull kelp in Antarctica. So those, um, it seems that the environmental, the, the extremes um, of the environment in Antarctica are preventing establishment of these species um, down in Antarctic waters, but that could change. So modeling of terrestrial and marine ecosystems in Antarctica suggests that particularly the West Antarctic Peninsula is going to experience um, extreme warming over the next few decades. And by the end of this century, we might have coastal marine waters that are similar to um, South Antarctic, current South Antarctic um, coast coastlines. So we could see establishment of some of these um, species in Antarctica over the coming decades, potentially by the end of the century, in which case we'll see a shift from these quite ice scoured Antarctic coastlines where you don't see um, these large macro algae to something a bit more like the sub-Antarctic, which are heavily kelp dominated um, and have a very large um, kelpy and uh, um, diverse intertidal ecosystems.
So we're now going to try to take this, um, this discovery and answer a whole bunch of other questions. We, we want to know which other species are able to hit uh, the Antarctic coast. So there is evidence that macrocystis can get there. We could apply those same genomic approaches to try to find out where the macrocystis is coming from, that's giant kelp, where it's coming from. We can look at the animals that we think are rafting with the kelp and see if we think they'll be able to survive in future Antarctic conditions, particularly the dark of the winters. And we can do some more modeling to try to understand the patterns and processes involved. Do we really see um, which parts of the coast around Antarctica are going to be most impacted um, where are most propagules coming from? So we can start to see, understand the vulnerability of Antarctica to change with global warming. So I'll finish there. And just as we're changing slides, I'll just play you this little video of um, kelp rafts released from South Georgia, um, simulated kelp rafts traveling around the Southern Ocean. The orange ones are eventually going to hit the Antarctic coast. The blue ones are not, but you can see straight away that there's huge spread, that even though they're released from the same time in the same place, that they all start taking different trajectories. Some of them are going to hit the Antarctic coast and some are not. Thank you. This is so clunky. Uh, Kia I want to talk to you today about um, some mollusks, some limpets, and I want to present some work that I have done with my Chilean colleague here, um, uh, Claudio Gonzalez Weaver, and the map that you see there highlights many of the islands that I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm delighted to follow Crid because she's explained all about the currents around Antarctica that are central to the talk that I'm going to give. The other theme that I want to pick up on that previous speakers have mentioned is about how it's important to use multiple lines of evidence when trying to understand what's going on. So this project grew out of a collaboration that I had previously with these three people here looking at this uh, macroalgae de Villiers Antarctica, and it's, um, it's being used as a vehicle for many organisms to get around the Antarctic or the subantarctic. And you can see in this picture here, the whole fast is covered in a lot of organisms there. It's not obvious what they are, but Crit has shown you what many of them are, and many of those species have certain um, Antarctic distributions. I want today to talk about two limpets. These are the limpets. Um, several centimetres across, two, three centimetres across. Um, so they're not tiny little limpets. One of them is a patellogastropod, which means in a checklist they come near the beginning, and one is a pulmonate, which means in a checklist they come near the end. So they're not closely related, and that's what we really need to know. Um, both, both groups, both genera, Nacella and Siphonaria, are abundant around the rocky shores of the Southern Ocean. And they're both, to a certain degree, associated with Davilia Antarctica. Um, in part because they're limpets, they don't have a lot of morphological characters and the species limits, you know, what was one species, what was another, uh, wasn't obvious and the distribution of those different species was also not clear. But molecular techniques have really revolutionised um, our understanding of the species boundaries and the distribution and they've revealed both crypsis and polyphenism in these species. So I want to start by talking first about uh, the 12 living species of Nacella, and you can see, if you look carefully at this diagram here along the coasts, uh, especially in southern South America, there are a number of species there, but there's another species that's on the Antarctic Peninsula, and then around on Marion, Crozet, Kerguelen, Heard, Macquarie, and Campbell Islands, there are also other species, and the different colours indicate different species. So, um, as I said to you before, one of the problems with this group is that many of them look alike, and here are five of the species, and you can see there's significant variation within the species, and in fact, probably as much variation within the species as there is among. Uh, there are ways to tell them apart, but they are uh, an ideal group for using molecular techniques to work out what species boundaries are. So um, when you, we've had a look at the molecular phylogeny of Nacella, and this is some work that we published um, last year, and you can see here from this diagram that there were two major clades of Nacella. They diverged about 12 and a half million years ago. 
And one of the clades is the subantarctic Antarctic clade, and that's the clade that I want to concentrate on. The other clade is mostly restricted to um, South America, Southern South America, and I haven't time to talk about it. But this clade here is particularly interesting. If we look from the top of um, the screen here down to the bottom, what you see is a series of island endemics. So the first species, Nacella edgari, occurs just on Kerguelen and Heard Islands. The next species is just on Campbell, the next just on Macquarie, and you can see all the way down down the bottom to one, uh, the second to bottom one there occurs on the Antarctic Peninsula, all the rest are on these various islands. And you can see there actually there are two species there that occur on Kerguelen and Heard Islands. Um, the interesting thing is that this group um, split about seven and a half million years ago, and there are further splits in the millions of years, but the most recent splits are remarkably recent, uh, less than a million years ago. And that's particularly interesting. So um, here's sort of what we think happened in one of those clades here, uh, the ancestral um, form, which is, uh, has descendants today still on the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, presumably these things rafted on Duvillia Antarctica. They are associated, as I said, with Duvillia Antarctica. You can find young ones often in the whole face of Duvillia, um, and sometime subsequently, some Duvillia reached Kerguelen or Heard. Um, presumably that, that um, Davilia would have come from southern South America, whether, um, because of course, as Pitt said, there's not Davilia on the Antarctic Peninsula as yet. Subsequently, the Crozet and Marion Island groups were uh, colonized. And then um, in the other group, which presumably started in the same sort of place, originally uh, colonized Kerguelen, and I think it'd be really interesting to look at some of the models that we've talked about to see whether Kerguelen and Heard are some of the first islands that are colonized um, when you start off in that part of the world. Subsequently, but much later, Macquarie and then Campbell Island um, seem to have been colonized. And if you go and look at a, a little sort of homemade movie of what's going on, um, everything starts presumably in southern South America um, and northern um, part of the Antarctic Peninsula, you get the colonization of Kurd and Kerguelen, um, and then right at the end, you get these other colonizations, which were much, much more recent. Okay, now I want to move on to talk about Siphonaria. These two species of Siphonaria were not separated until 2016. They are truly cryptic species. When you see them on the screen like that, you can see very clearly that they look different, right? The apex of the shell in Siphonaria food. food Fragiensis um, is over the edge of the shell, whereas in lateralis, the apex sits over the top of the shell. That seems pretty obvious on a screen like that, but when you go out in the field and you see them cheek by jowl uh, right next to each other there, you could easily just write it off as within species variation. Siphonaria, uh, both those species of Siphonaria are closely associated with Davilia. So you can see them on the holdfast, right in the holdfast, buried in the holdfast. You can also see them on the stipe uh, of the Davilia, as we can see in the top right of the picture there. So um, we collected Siphonaria around the subantarctic, as we had with the nacella, and again we looked at the genetics. And this is the result that we got. So these are some haplotype diagrams here, and the different parts of the pies are coloured according to where the um, samples came from. So if we look on the left there, we can see a haplotype network for CO1, and then the top of the diagram there we have Siphonaria lateralis, and in the bottom we have Siphonaria fragiensis. And you can see there are 44 differences there that are clearly separate in, in CO1. But what you can also see uh, in CO1 there for Siphonaria lateralis is that the samples that came from Pacific Patagonia, Kerguelen Island, Antarctic pa Patagonia, and even Macquarie Island were all identical. They had the same CO1 haplotype. There is a little bit of diversity there. The Falkland Malvinas Islands there seem to have a slightly different version of CO1, but pretty much everything else is either the same or one step different in the case of South Georgia. Um, in Siphonaria fuegiensis, we see pretty much the same thing, except this time in Antarctic, uh, sorry, Atlantic Patagonia and the Falkland Malvinas share um, haplotypes there. If you go and look at ITS1 and ITS2, you can see basically that all the variation is found um, uh, among islands there. There's no island endemics except possibly, again, for the Falkland Malvinas Islands. Whereas um, for 28S, uh, again, there's very little variation, a couple of one step differences there. So we've got a completely different picture here. Right, for Nacella, we had island endemics. Here we have 
two species that are circumantarctic, right? There's the same species all the way around on all these different island groups. So there's something clearly very different going on. So um, here, this little table here is meant to just summarize what, just what's going on there. Um, the, the, the cellar, we have at least six endemic um, uh, species that are endemic to an island or perhaps an island group in the case of Cook Wayland and Heard Islands, whereas in Siphonaria we have two species that are distributed all the way around the Antarctic. Um, in the cellar we have species level reciprocal monophyly, whereas in Siphonaria we have all the nuclear genes being shared and small or no mitochondrial DNA differences. The difference really is in their association with Davilia. So Nacella is only really occasionally found on Davilia. So most of the time it occurs on the rocky shores, actually attached to the rock. It's a limpet that lives on rocks, sometimes subtidally, but in nevertheless it prefers rocks. Occasionally you do find young ones in the holdfast of Davilia, but it's not as common. Whereas Siphonaria is, is usually abundant on Davilia. Um, I would say that the majority of, of Davilia holdfast, if you go and look in them, will have some siphonaria in them. So their association is much stronger. There's also differences in their biology, right? Siphonaria is air breathing, whereas Nacella uses gills. I don't think that's as important, but um, the, the diff there's a difference, important difference in the larvae, right? So the, the Nacella actually has a villager that's released into the water and it spends about a month in the plankton. Whereas Siphonaria, there are little young adults that emerge from the eggs, right? So if Siphonaria is being transported around the um, Antarctic, or the subantarctic, and the young adults emerge from the egg, they will also be on those species of Davilia, and that seems an ideal way to be getting around. If you're a villager being released into the water column, you're not going to be able to be transported around the Southern Ocean quite as much. So, in summary, the frequency of rafting is absolutely critical in determining the degree of de genetic divergence, right? So the cellar rafts much less often, it's much more genetically diverse because every time an island is colonized, you get a speciation event. That's not the case for Siphonaria, where the populations are pretty much well connected. Very frequent rafting only allows minor differentiation and connects those populations. So uh, I just need to acknowledge a lot of people here working in this part of the world requires uh, real team efforts and there's lots of people who contributed to this work and it's not cheap either and I've had very generous funding. If you're interested in the details, those are the details of the papers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hamish. All right, next up we have... Um, Ella Hepavesi and um, Felix Wolf, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who are going to talk about um, how earthquake uplift. It's, a, it's another Kelpie talk yeah, <laughs> because kelp is <laughs> awesome. Okay, so we're going to be talking about the genomic footprints of coastal, coastal earthquake uplifts in New Zealand. And so very broadly, I just want to begin by talking about the fact that when you look on an ecological level or in terms of phenotypes, nature is really uniform. Things generally have a very patchy distribution. And that was observed by lots of people for many centuries, but Alexander von Humboldt was one of the first people to try and identify a process that underlines that patchiness in nature. So he looked at things like the latitudinal biodiversity gradient, but also things about how, say, vegetation cover varies with altitude. And that was really kind of one of the beginnings of modern biogeography. And in the subsequent decades, since we've become aware of genetics and developed genetic sequencing, we've noticed that that kind of patchiness that occurs in phenotypes also occurs in genotypes and in genetic data. And it typically manifests as high genetic differentiation among populations. So what can drive that kind of patchiness and high genetic differentiation? Well, it can be caused by things like selection so if populations have adapted to different regions, then they could have quite a high genetic differentiation. But it can also be caused by more neutral processes, such as isolation processes. So the isolation process that most people are familiar with is isolation by distance. So if you imagine that you're sampling across a species geographic range, if you compare populations from opposite ends of that geographic range, um, the distance between them is really quite far. And therefore, migration has to occur over a large distance and dispersal has to go a long way. And that means that gene flow is fairly restricted, which therefore means that genetic differentiation between those populations on opposite ends of the geographic range is fairly high. In contrast, though, if you compare populations that are adjacent to one another, 
um, the distance seen was really small and therefore dispersal was fairly frequent and following on from that genetic differentiation was fairly low. So in isolation by distance the genetic differentiation among populations generally reflects geographic distance. But another isolation process that we're looking at today is isolation by colonization. So I want you to imagine that a new habitat becomes available and it's colonized for, by individuals from a source population or source meta population. And just by chance, it's unlikely that a large number of individuals are gonna colonize that new habitat. And so it's gonna be a fairly small number of individuals. And because it's a small number of individuals, there's likely to be biases in the sampling. And therefore, a founder effect is likely to occur. So the genotype, genotypic variation in the new population that's colonized isn't likely to exactly reflect the source meta population or population. And therefore, if we're comparing that new population once it's established itself later on to other populations in that species, it could have really quite high genetic differentiation when compared to the others. But that genetic differentiation doesn't reflect, um, say, a bit of difficult, dis difficulty dispersing to that population or environmental differences or selection. It simply reflects the colonization history of that site. So what would be an ideal system to look at isolation by colonization? Well, we think it would be more <laughs> Davilia Southern Bull Cow. So Davilia, as I'm sure you're starting to learn, are large brown macroalgae found throughout the Southern Hemisphere, and they occur in really high densities along large parts of New Zealand. And Davilia, well, some of the species of Davilia are buoyant because they have this honeycomb structure in the fronds of the kelp that traps air. And Davilia are very much an intertidal or at least shallow subtidal group of species. So they're very sensitive to changes in water temperature and exposure to surf. I mean, they are hardy because they're withstanding, you know, getting battering mounted by waves continuously, but they are very much restricted to that intertidal zone. And so if we want to look at isolation by colonization in Davilia, we really need there to be new habitats. And if there are going to be new habitats after millions and millions of years of this kelping around, we really, need, we, really, really, uh, we really need there to be a source of disturbance. So what would disturb Davilia southern bull kelp? Well, it's earthquakes. So if you recently in 2016, there was a large earthquake in New Zealand in the Kaikoura region, which is in the northern half of the South Island of New Zealand. And it caused significant uplift along the coastline. So some regions were lifted up by two meters, but other regions were lifted up by as much as 12 meters. And as you can see from these photos, this caused a mass die off of Davilia. And the exciting thing was that a new intertidal zone was formed by the earthquake. And in subsequent years, we've been able to observe and sample new plants of Davilia as they established themselves on that new intertidal zone. So that's allowing us to track the evolution of a new population. And we should be able to observe if there is an isolation by colonization effect in real time. That research is currently ongoing, um, but we wanted to see if historic earthquake, earthquake events have caused a long lasting effect on Davilia's population structure. So can we observe a long lasting effect from an isolation by distance, uh, isolation by colonization of event? And so we're gonna focus on a historic uplift in the Akatore fault zone. So this occurred between 600 to 900 years ago. The coastline was lifted up by two to three meters, which is significant enough to completely extirpate the bilia. And Ali's gonna talk about your work now. Thank you. So the first piece of evidence that there might have been a genetic disruption due to the activity of the Akator fault zone was provided by 2015 CO1 study under Vilia Antarctica. Obviously, the main focus of this study was not Akator, but the few haplotypes that have been collected from the Akator uplifted coastline were completely different from the adjacent sites. So in 2019, uh, we did a fine scale sampling uh, from every two to four kilometers uh, from the Rubilia Antarctica populations uh, within the uplifted region and flanking non uplifted sites. Uh, to have a more comprehensive understanding of how haplotype diversity is changing along the coast. Uh, we found that the whole uplifted region is, uh, is fixed for the New Zealand South 2 haplotype, which is shown in red, and that is the common haplotype of the north. 
And also, haplotype diversity and composition is completely different in the non-uplifted neighboring sites immediately to the north and south of Akato. Uh, next, we extended our fine scale sampling to other Durvillia species uh, in order to understand how different levels of buoyancy and tidal ranges uh, can affect population's response to the earthquake disturbance. So we collected uh, several, several co-distributed Durvillia species uh, and we obtained the SNP data from genotyping by sequencing. Uh, the Durvillia species that we studied are, um, first of all, uh, Durvillia poha, uh, Duvilia poha is intertidal and uh, buoyant, uh, and it prefers more sheltered sites of rocky intertidal zone. Then we had Duvilia antarctica, which is uh, again intertidal and buoyant, but it prefers more wave exposed parts. And finally, we had the subtidal and non buoyant Duvilia velana. And uh, for both intertidal Durvillia, we found uh, an abrupt change in genotype composition, which is associated to the uplift boundaries. However, for the subtidal Durvillia velana, uh, we didn't find any uplift associated genetic patchiness or genetic structure. So the populations of Durvillia velana might not have been affected by the earthquake. So if the intertidal Durvillia went uh, through a genetic turnover as a result of Akator earthquake disturbance, how their hold fast epibiota responded to such a disturbance? To answer this question, uh, we obtained the SNP data from some hold fast epibiota. Uh, they are obligate hold fast dwellers and they are brooders uh, and uh, they are strictly intertidal. So their survival and dispersal depend heavily on the survival and dispersal of Durvillia poha and Durvillia And if you would like to know more about the details, you can find out in our papers. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Felix and Eri. All right, we're keeping pretty well to time. We've got um, two last talks before we'll open it up to questions. Just a reminder to those listening in, if you have questions um, as you're watching, please feel free to put them in the, um, in the question and answer section and we'll get to those uh, after we finish all the talks. Okay. Kirsten. Thank you. <laughs> right, the talk I'm gonna to give today on biogeography of South Pacific top shells is work that was done some time ago, but I thought it would be suitable for our Humboldt Day talk. Um, one of the more famous things Humboldt said was the the study of natural endeavors is to connect the present with the past, which basically is what we've been trying to do with these um, Pacific top shells to see how have the modern day distribution come about, is it by vicariance or dispersal? And also, um, Humboldt never got to New Zealand or Australia. He, was, he really wanted to, and he did this big tour and spent eight months getting to the south west coast of South America and then the boat <coughs> he was hoping to get on never made land so he had to go home and I wanted to include a sample that was kind of in the area that he came to which we do have some top shells from the west coast of South America. So how's their distribution, how does it come about? Is it by vicariants where they were originally all one Gondwanan distribution and as Gondwana split up the, that is how they became separated and typical um, the current distributions, or, or they would have a basal New Zealand groups with a very old, um, old group as New Zealand broke away from Gondwana about 80 million years ago, and then um, South America and Australia internal. Or um, is it a more typical dispersal pattern where the species have separated post um, Gondwana split, much more recent? And often in this area, a not always, but often a typical dispersal pattern that has Australia at the bottom and um, New Zealand and South America internal. And as we've seen a few times in the talks, this is a um, dispersal that often occurs in a clockwise direction around the Antarctic. Um, so this, at the start of this project, what we first wanted to do was have a really good phylogeny, which didn't exist before we started, and we got um, seven species from New Zealand, the um, Chilean species, nine species from Australia, and a couple of species from the, the tropical Pacific. We did some um, mitochondrial and nuclear sequencing where the ultimate goal was building a well-supported phylogenetic tree. 
um, oh, this is a typical sampling site near Dunedin. Um, the, this is a real soft cinnamon, mud flatty type beach. And it's really common to get the wee um, yellow snail at the bottom of New Zealand is really common on these types of beaches. But they're all intertidal and some of them do occur sympatrically. So the um, tree we built, this is a maximum likelihood tree and it's got both Bayesian and um, maximum likelihood support. We found there was a basal Australian group. There was two internal clades. One was completely Australian and the other one contained species from New Zealand, Chile, Australia and the tropical Pacific. This sort of tree, the way the clays fall would lead us to suspect that it's not really come about by vicariance. So then we tried to date some clays. The fossil record's quite poor, so we dated some clays based on the divergence rate of CO1, which we used the entire range that we could find for mollusks, which gave a really big range of rates, but we just included them all. And the dates we were getting vastly postdate any sort of vicariant explanation that was possible. The, the species are arriving in New Zealand no more than 24 million years ago, and the New Zealand Chilean split was less than a million years ago. And I just tried to demonstrate this in a wee cartoon. You can see they're arriving in Australia no more than 33 million years ago dispersing from Australia to the tropical Pacific and New Zealand no more than 24 million years ago and a very, very recent dispersal to Chile. So molecular techniques have shown us that a dispersal model is likely, but then we ask how on earth is this happening because adult top shells are strictly intertidal. The larvae are lysothotrites, but they're very short-lived. They only last a few days in the, in the water column, certainly not enough time to drift um, any distance. Yeah, this group has, has a very wide geographical um, dispersal range. So, of course, <laughs> the answer is good old kelp, Chevalier Antarctica. It's the only, the only species in our study which had a distribution spanning oceans is the only species that lives on kelp. The rest of them live on rocks and sand in the intertidal zone, whereas Diloma nigerima, which is found in New Zealand and Chile, is really, really often found living in the whole fast of kelp. I think um, Crid's already covered this, but this is a hold fast, which is, you see, it's, it's pitted and it, it's a really stable surface for a whole different community of organisms traveling. The fronds are tough, they're like honeycomb with all these air sacs, they're very buoyant and they can, they can survive for months in the water column and um, there's like millions of these floating around the Southern Ocean. And just, I thought this was quite interesting to map the distribution of the black is the top shell Diloma nigerima and the green is, is um, all kelp where it's growing and it's, you know, very, very good overlap. So some conclusions. I think the molecular techniques have shown that the current top shell, top shell distribution has arisen by marine dispersal. Um, we suspect that in the past um, that rafting in ocean currents has occurred on several occasions. I think with Nigerima this happened reasonably recently with yeah, bull kelp is the rafting subject and um, so the molecular techniques have gained, allowed us to gain an insight into the biogeography and it's just molecular techniques seems like a brilliant starting way of starting point for realising Humboldt's vision of correct, connecting the present with the past. As always, you don't do these studies alone. There's a massive list of people who've helped with the collecting particularly. And if anyone's more interested in reading up further on this work, there's a couple of publications that came out a while ago. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Kirsten. So we're going to uh, finish with the last talk uh, on something that doesn't involve kelp at all. <laughs> um, and uh, moving back onto terrestrial New Zealand look at flowering plants. This is Duncan Nickel. Thank you. All right. Uh, good morning or good evening, wherever you are. Um, 
My talk is on the biogeography and evolution of Salmisia, subgenus Lignose. And this is one of the species in the Nelson Mountains. And my work builds on a PhD that was recently done by Patricio Saldivia, who uh, revised the whole group of Salmisia. Yeah. So, Salmisia subgenus Lignose contains about 26 species. They're morphologically and geographically very uh, diverse. It's an endemic group to New Zealand, and they're quite widespread, ranging from Stewart Island all the way up to the Coromandel. Uh, they inhabit similar locations and similar environments, and even can be found uh, in the same habitat right uh, next to each other. For example, with the picture of Discolor and Sinclairii there. Along the lines of um, Humboldt, my research looks at defining and characterizing species within biogeographic spaces. So I then investigate the similarity of those species across those biogeographic spaces. And finally, I will build a phylogenetic tree for the group uh, in order to support evolutionary explanations for this investigation, as currently I've only got these descriptive um, results. So what's modeling spaces? First, I needed to go around and gather all the herbarium records for sub, um, Salmisia subgenus lignose, uh, which included about 3,000 records from Auckland, Wellington, Christchurch, and Otago Herbaria, and gather that information and turn them into distribution localities. So you can see the 3,000 or so points across New Zealand there, uh, with a heavy distribution in the south and a lot of uh, the Northland region uh, empty. From each of those points, I can then gather uh, climatic uh, data from them, and here we can see the mean temperatures of different species. So down the bottom, you can see Salmisia thomsonii, a high alpine uh, plant with an annual mean temperature of only just above four. Whereas up the top, uh, Salmisia lindsayi is a coastal species. So it has a moderate temperature of around 10 or 11. And I can do that for many climatic variables, which is available to us. Uh, thanks to like NIWA and other uh, agencies in New Zealand. So I can grab the temperature variables, precipitation variables, and solar radiation variables of New Zealand and create a background New Zealand climatic space, which here you can see in gray. All the gray dots are the uh, environments of the background New Zealand. And then I can put on top of that all the distribution localities of Salmisia subgenus lignose, which you can see as the black dots. Within that climatic space, I can find climatic niches for all my different species. Uh, so for example, Salmisia holosericea has a wider climatic niche than Salmisia lateralis villosa. And just like geographic space, you can see that there's separating climatic niches and overlapping climatic niches. The, the top two examples and the bottom two examples. I then collected around 80 uh, binary character states of morphological descriptions of the species and did a similar PCA to find similarities or plot the morphological discrepancies between all the species and you can see clusters of similar morphologically um, characterized species like Durietii, Sinclairii, Alanii, Bomplandii uh, on the left there. And then you can see odd, oddball ones that um, come out, for example, Gibbsii or Philocrimna and Ramulosa, quite different from the rest. So once I created those uh, geographic spaces of the species, I can then look at how similar are the species pairs uh, between those spaces. For example, 
Here we can take Bomplandii and Cocaniana. Uh, Bomplandii, a fjordland based species, and Cocaniana, a inland Marlborough species. And we can see how similar they are in geography just by calculating the distance between them. We can then go to the climatic space, uh, get the same Bomplandii, Cocaniana uh, niche, calculate the distance between them, and their morphological. Uh, distance as well. We can calculate the distance between them relative to all the others. I then create a big matrix of the geographic, climatic, and morphological uh, similarity of all the species pairs in this uh, clade. So you've got Bomplandia cocainiana, Bomplandia discolor, uh, all the pairs, all the way down to all the sets of them, and then you, I asked, well, how does geographic similarity compare with climatic similarity? Or how does geographic similarity compare with morphological similarity? And so here's the association between climatic and geographic, where as you get geographically distant, uh, you also get environmentally distant, which is kind of what Felix was talking about, where geography comes in patchiness and it's likely that as you get further away uh, in distance from a species towards the mountains or towards the coast then the environmental or climatic uh, variables and factors are going to differ um, in the same response. However when we look at the association between morphological and geographic similarity there doesn't seem to be a relationship here where morphology doesn't seem to track uh, how far species pairs are geographically. So as you get more distant from a species, you don't necessarily get more morphologically dissimilar. Uh, surprisingly, it's also the same environmentally where you can be environmentally exactly the same. Uh, as you see on the left side of the screen, uh, zero environmental similarity means they're basically exactly the same, inhabiting exactly the same environment or climatic niche, yet their morphological uh, similarity ranges from nearly basically similar to uh, very, very different. So there doesn't seem to be a relationship there. Uh, however, I can't explain those results in a evolutionary context because we don't currently have a phylogenetic or evolutionary tree for Salmizia subgenus lignose. So uh, Patricio Saldivia, who's also a PhD student in botany, has recently circumscribed the subtribe Salmiciene and my, the rest of my PhD, or a component of my PhD, will be to create an evolutionary tree which delimitates species within Salmisia subgenus lignose. And hopefully, I'll be able to explain some of those previous results evolutionarily. So, some of my conclusions morphological similarity is not necessarily associated, or doesn't seem to be associated with geographic or climatic similarity. There must be other drivers of, of morphological difference. Um, species in this lineage seem to be more similar climatically than geographically, uh, but a uh, phylogenary is required in order to make sense of these relationships in the context of evolution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Duncan. All right, um, thank you to those of you who are still here. Um, there's We've got a decent audience still. So we haven't had any, oh, wait, there, there is a thank you coming through. No, <laughs> no questions yet. Um, but look, I thought we'd have a panel chat anyway. Um, since we've got uh, so, so many interesting biogeographers in the room. So uh, I thought I'd kick it off by asking the panel what, how do you think Southern Hemisphere biogeography 
differs from Northern Hemisphere biogeography. I guess many of the world's biogeographers are concentrated in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, but what's exciting about the Southern Hemisphere? Oh, de Villiers. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, bull kelp is a big part of that. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think there's geographically, they're very different, right? We're much more oceanic down here in the South. So um, perhaps that's why so much of the biogeography that we do in the Southern Hemisphere is, um, is looking at oceanic dispersal. How do, how do species cross oceans? Um, I think sometimes the Northern Hemisphere biogeography can be more focused on movement across land um, and, and the impacts of the past ice ages. Certainly for people, it's, it's the presence of you know, the numerous islands uh, in the Pacific. You do have Hawaii up in the Northern Hemisphere, but you have this strand, you know, continuous uh, sequence of islands moving from west to east uh, below the equator. Yeah. Um, and of course, the, the winds and currents um, that were affecting Pacific colonists as well are relatively constant. Yeah, definitely uh, island, island settlement is, is focused in the Southern Pacific rather than in the Northern Pacific, but yeah. I think of that kind of oceanic dispersal as well, it is kind of, it would almost biases through yeah, people's analyses as well, and that they always assume isolation and it's always assumed that there'll be mm -hmm. some kind of pan in the vicariance or something like that. And I think what's changed more in the last 20 or 30 years is the recognition of dispersal being more frequent than people first realized, um, which again does kind of reflect cultural biases as well, I think. And also the, yeah, the evolution of the genetic and genomic approaches yeah. that enable us to test some of those hypotheses um, more directly. Um, we have had a question from the audience come in, this one's for Duncan. Um, what are some of the variables that you used in your morphological analysis? Uh, so this was all the descriptions from Patricio's. Um, oh, they so they weren't functional traits, if that's what you're asking. They're all just uh, character traits based on delimiting species. So the fillaries have been a very good uh, character, whether they've got glands or not, for example. Um, whether the peduncle is hairy, uh, all the all of the um, Basically, taxonomic characters would be the. Did you have any measurements like the length of the leaf or? <clears throat> uh, because the most of the species, um, they can vary from. Well, they have clinal morphologicals, so they on some parts of the distribution they'll have like ten millimeter leaves, and then at the end of it they'll have up to five centimeters or something like that. Um, so, Patricio tried to stay away from the measuring side of stuff and <laughs> stayed with binary uh, characters, yeah. Oh, I should just comment too that we're not being socially irresponsible. We, we don't need to distance quite as much in New Zealand as um, in some other parts of the world at the moment because, uh, because of the barrier of the ocean, we're quite <laughs> protected from um, COVID. For now, down here, we haven't had a case in the South Island for several months. Except so. the Cook Strait. Keep it in the north. Uh, so it's come back into New Zealand recently, but so far hasn't made it down to the south, which is why we all look so relaxed and maskless. Um, all right. Um, I just thought, let's finish up with a, a brief discussion about um, biogeography in the context of climate change. So I, um, as Kirsten pointed out, um, one of Humboldt's comments was that we we look into the past to understand the present. What about understanding the future and how we're moving um, into a period of rapid climate change? How can the biogeographic methods that we're using help us to plan for the future? Pin drop silence. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I was just going to say, I think one of the, I'm not sure if it really helps to plan, but one of the things that's just remarkable about it is that when we're talking about all of these biogeographic processes, a lot of like the dispersal for events, for instance, they're fairly infrequent, but on an evolutionary time scale, they occur often enough that it can have a significant effect. Yeah. 
but with things like climate change now causing the ocean to warm so quickly, that kind of change is happening. I mean, it's happening, but it's going to have a massive evolutionary effect in a very short term, short term, uh, short time period. I think that's a really good point because if if a dispersal event is only going to happen once every few hundred or thousand years, um, some of these species might not have time um, in the context of rapid climate change to wait for that to happen. So certainly um, <laughs> one of the geographic implications of the southern hemisphere is we've got this big southern ocean at the base of the, the major continents. Um, so a lot of species are moving towards the poles, they're moving south. What do they do when they get to the southern tip of those continents? Many of them are just going to drop off into the ocean. Um, so, so they're going to have to be able to disperse. And I think this raises really interesting questions about um, should we assist them to disperse in the future, knowing that given enough time, many of them might have, um, if the climate were changing more slowly, should we now think about, goes against everything we stand for, but should we think about perhaps helping some species to move to new places um, if they're not going to survive where they are? What are the implications for the species in the, in the new areas that they're moving to? It's interesting because some species will be much better able to disperse themselves or on a vehicle. So, you know, one of my predictions would be that things that are associated with Davilia will be able to disperse much more readily. Um, species that, that you know, use just the water column or, or currents and so on presumably won't disperse as easily. Um, but I don't know. It's a, you know, it's a kind of testable prediction. I was really interested in the suggestion that we would have um, living Davilia in the Antarctic Peninsula um, maybe not too far into the future. I think that's absolutely right. And I think it'd be really interesting if we could predict which species will be associated with the Davilia there as well. And again, that, those models that suggest where, where the propagules that land on the, on the west part of the Antarctic Peninsula, where they come from, will be a strong predictor of yeah. the, the associated invertebrates there. Yeah. So that's an area we're hoping to mm -hmm. go into in the near future. Question. Uh, okay, so we've got a question from Richard Field. Building on uh, my point about assisted migration, to what extent are biogeographers involved in policy making in New Zealand? Uh, well, Hamish, you're yeah. directly yeah. involved <laughs> in um, this. So I spend, um, I spend half my time as uh, a science advisor to our Ministry of what's called Business Innovation and Employment, but it isn't fact our ministry of science so i um, as i sound seconded half time to this ministry as a science advisor and there's in fact a network of science advisors that uh, advise different ministries the department of conservation for example has a, a science advisor who again is a practicing scientist and who is interested in, in questions exactly like this i think um as as this year has shown new zealand is quite good at looking at scientific evidence to make policy decisions compared to some other countries perhaps. Um, we do have a government that's interested in the evidence um, and uses evidence to inform policy so that's quite encouraging and and a public that, that generally that's trusts right. science yeah. and engages with science is, is relatively um, scientifically literate so I think that's yeah. the other uh, important. That's right, it's not just the government, it's the public um, attitude to, to science and evidence is really, um, it's heartening to come here <laughs> and, and see this, um, this mentality. All right, does anyone in the panel have any further comments before we wrap up? I'd like to thank the audience. I, I know we've got people from all over the world. Um, Darko's commented, um, he's from Chile. Um, we've got people in Europe um, and the Americas. Um, and so thank you all. I know it's awkward timing for some of you. Um, thank you all for making the effort to come along to this live session. And for those of you who haven't made it to the live session, uh, this will be posted online. Um, so thank you for watching if you're watching later. And thank you to all the panelists for making time to come and talk today. Thank you, Craig, for organizing. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Going back to yesterday now. <laughs> Richard says this. Enjoy the 14th. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. Have a good day. <laughs>